So, we shall now start our discussion on clocking in digital circuits. And when over the next uh, few weeks actually we shall be talking about various issues related to clocking and timing and crosstalk and so on and so forth. Clock is a very important component of any digital system that we use today, because as you know most of the circuits and systems that we talk about that we use in practice are sequential in nature. So, there are a lot of events which are going on inside the chip or the circuitry and everything is controlled by a clock, a clock signal which acts as some kind of a synchronizing master for the entire system. Faster the clock, faster would be the operation. So, when we talk about clock, there are a number of issues that we need to consider. Of course, what is a clock signal, what are the different uh, aspects related to the speed of operation of a circuit, what are the different kinds of parameters that you define with respect to a clock. And of course, we shall see later on that when we talk about high performance circuits which are very common nowadays, we want to run a circuit as fast as we can, which means the delay of the circuit, the clock frequency can be increased as much as possible. Of course, within some other limits of power consumption that we will talk about later again. Okay. So, we start our discussion in this lecture about clock design. Okay. So, as I said clocking is the basic concept behind synchronization in digital system. So, any sequential circuit almost all the sequential circuits today are synchronous in nature. In contrast you can have asynchronous systems which are of course, much more difficult to design and control although they might promise better or a higher speed it is extremely difficult to design and of course, uh, to verify such uh, circuits and systems. So, almost all the systems that we talk about in terms of synchronous circuits are synchronous in nature, there is a clock which controls all operations. So, there are a few very important clocking related parameters that we shall be talking about namely skew and jitter. There are a number of delay constraints that also we shall talk about, which are some kind of max constraints and min constraints, these are called setup and hold times, and we shall talk about some of the factors that affect these skew and jitter kind of phenomena. Okay. So, this is what I talked about. Most of the chips that are you that are in use today are synchronous in nature which means there is a reference clock. Typically, there is a single clock in many systems, there can be multiple clock phases which are generated from a single external source. So, all the internal activities of the chips of the chip they are synchronized with respect to the clock that is applied from outside typically. So, the clock signal is used to synchronize the storage elements the flip flops, because you know that uh, when you have a flip flop for example, let us say I have a D flip flop which has a D input and a Q output and there will be a clock input, this is clock. So, here whatever I apply to D that will get stored inside the flip flop in synchronism with a clock. So, when I say the clock signal, so the ideal clock signal will be like this, it will be a periodic signal that will go up and down with certain time period, let us say t. So, depending on the type of flip flop, these uh, flip flop can be activated either at the rising edge of the clock, whenever the clock signal goes from 0 to 1 or whenever the clock signal goes from 1 to 0. So, when it is negative edge triggered we usually use a 
bubble at the clock signal clock input to indicate this. Okay. These are typically called H triggered flip flop. Now, in contrast we can have a latch where the storage is not controlled by the edges of the clock, but by the level as long as the clock is high this flip flop or latch is open whatever is coming input in the at the input will get stored and the last value. So, after clock goes down that will be the value that will get stored finally. Okay. Okay. The next thing that we talk about is pipelining. Most of the systems that we use today they are highly pipelined they are pipeline systems or pipeline processors various kinds of. So, in a typical instruction pipelining for example, so all the processors that we talk about today they use pipelining internally to, to improve the number of instructions that are executed per second it improves the throughput and aggressive pipelining leads to higher frequency of operation I will try to explain this, but how a pipeline looks like a pipeline looks like something like this. This is an example of a two stage pipeline this black shaded regions are the two stages and there are some registers or storage elements in between they are controlled by a clock and this is a four stage pipeline. So, what is the basic idea behind the pipeline let me try to explain with the help of a simple um, just example. Suppose, I have some computation that I want to perform let us call it S. So, I apply an input I get an output. Suppose, the time taken to process one set of data is T. Therefore, for n data items So, what will be the total time let us call it time n this will be n multiplied by t. Now, what I do what I say is that instead of this single stage I divide this computation into smaller steps. So, let us take as example 4. So, I call them S 1 S 2 S 3 and S 4. So, the input is coming the output of S 1 is going to the input of S 2 output of S 2 is going to input of S 3 and so on. So, the, the idea is as follows this whole computation S 1 I am as if dividing up, up into 4 parts. So, I call them S 1 S 2 S 3 and S 4 it is not like I am multiplying the hardware four times same hardware, but I am partitioning it into four parts which are approximately of equal complexity in terms of time. Now, in terms of the data item let us say the input data are coming 1, 2, 3, 4 like that. So, it works like this these are the time steps let us say the time taken to for one stage to complete let us call it uh, small t. So, t 2 t 3 t and so on. So, what will happen the first let us indicate the stages S 1 S 2 S 3 and S 4. So, the idea will be like this this S 1 will start working on data set 1 after it finishes it will go to S 2 after it finishes it will go to S 3 after it finishes it will go to S 4. Now, when this S 1 output of S 1 goes to input of S 2 the idea of pipelining is I want to start the second input computation in S 1 in the same overlap fashion. Similarly, when this goes to S 3 I want to start 2 here and start 3 here. So, in this way this will go on in an overlap fashion. 
in this way it will go on you see after 4 time steps the first output is generated and after that in every time step one output will get generated. So, for n data items you can have a calculation like this the total time will be number of stages here 4 minus 1 this is the time that is taken for the pipe to fill up plus the number of data because after this initial time of 3 I will be getting one output every clock plus n whole multiplied by t. So, it is approximately n plus 3 right. See uh, this uh, this n t you can say this is approximately equal to n into 40. So, you can see in the same time I am able to have a uh, speed up of about 4. So, this implies a speed up of approximately 4 equal to the number of stages, but of course, in order to isolate these stages we need to have register stages in between the stages, this will be fed by a clock, this will be a clock signal. This is the basic idea behind pipelining and almost all systems that we see today has an internal pipeline structure because of efficiency considerations because of throughput increase increase in throughput that you get by doing that. Okay. So, this is the basic idea and you can see that essentially we have several S 1, S 2, S 3, S 4 blocks which are combinational circuits and there are some registers or storage elements in between. This is how a typical circuit today looks like. Okay. So, this will motivate you uh, to appreciate the examples that we that we shall see later on because we shall see later on essentially what we have we have two storage elements with some combination circuits in between. So, in the lowest level there will be two flip flops with some small combination circuit in between. So, if we can analyze that small circuit we can also analyze a flip uh, analyze a pipeline kind of an architecture which basically has a very similar structure. Okay. So, another issue also let, let us talk about this is something related to the performance of a processor. So, here we are talking about a CPU a processor which is executing instructions. Well, similar kind of discussion can apply to other kind of digital circuits also, but we are basically talking about a processor here. So, the total execution time here will be the product of number of instructions, instruction count, number of clock cycles required to execute every instruction this is called cycles per instructions multiplied by clock period, clock cycle time. So, if you multiply these three things together you get the total execution time for a program. Now, if I want to make a processor faster that means, I want to reduce the execution time. So, how I can do it? I can do it in three different ways. I can either reduce the number of instructions, this I can do by modifying the instruction set architecture. Like for example, suppose I have a computer where I do not have a multiply instruction. So, to multiply I may have to use a number of instructions, but if I move to a new instruction set where there is a multiply number of instructions will be less that is one way to reduce IC. Reduce cycles per instruction well, here we can have a better pipeline, deeper pipeline, increase number of pipeline stages, make the processing more overlapped, we will be getting greater speed up. So, number of cycles needed per instruction will go down. And of course, when you talk about reducing the time period, clock period or CCT, it depends on how we are doing logic design. This is something which will be the topic of our discussion primarily and of course, on the fabrication technology. Better technology will mean faster circuit which will mean faster clock, but technology is sometimes not within the control of a designer 
designer can play with the logic design with the gates with the flip flops and find out ways to make the circuit run faster without errors okay that is what you want to look at so our primary focus will be on the clocking issues specifically the third one reduction of cct so how we can do this well i talked about h triggered flip flops there are a few statements we are making here of course we'll be explaining this a little later in more detail first is that most of the circuits that we use today they are based on h triggered operation that means the flip flop gets triggered whenever the clock goes from low to high positive h triggered or from high to low negative h triggered so data living at a time t let's say must arrive at the next flip flop well then after t plus t okay t is the clock period there is something called once the concept of setup time this we shall see later just let us ignore this for the time being now right now so what we are saying is that data must arrive at the next flip flop one setup time before t plus t well here we are again talking about that pipeline kind of an architecture so you stick to this kind of an architecture where i have a stage which is a combination circuit i have a register let's say ri i have another register let's say ri plus 1 so the output of this goes to the input of this output of this goes to the input of this and i have a clock signal that is used to clock this register as well as this register and t is the time period of the clock this is t so what you are saying is that whatever data that is living here let's say this time is small t so it should be ready suppose these registers are all leading a positive h triggered so when the next stage comes before that this data must be ready in the next flip flop so that the correct output will get stored okay so this capital time t of course there is something called setup time i shall talk about later it is a property of the storage elements so we have to give some uh, you can say uh, uh, means a uh, provision with respect to the clock period to take care of this uh, something called setup time this we shall see later a little later okay so basically the clocking relationships are like this delay from each input flip flop to each output flip flop of a combination block which means for a pipeline circuit the input register to the output register of a stage should be less than t ignoring setup if you have setup so t will become a little less so this we shall see a little later why t is becoming a little less and another important property of the clock signal this also we shall be addressing later that if there are many flip flops or registers in a circuit so what we want ideally is that the signal should reach all flip flops almost at the same time so if this cannot be ensured then the correctness of operation can be compromised so this is also one very important design parameter for clock circuitry that whenever i want to or wherever i want to feed the clock signal they should all reach there almost at the same time this is something we shall be discussing later not right now okay so this is what we are saying that we have a clock signal coming starting from time t t plus capital t is the time period t plus 2t so you have a stage let's consider one stage which essentially is a combination circuit with a register before that register after that this clock comes and this time t should be large enough so that whatever is the worst case delay of the combination circuit that computation should be complete so that whenever the next h comes here the correct output 
should get stored here. So, if this is ensured only then the pipelining should work properly that the, the output of stage 1 should go to stage 2, stage 2 should go to stage 3, because the next data is also coming parallelly. So, there will be an overlap kind of execution as data 1 goes from stage 1 to stage 2, data 2 will come into stage 1. So, there should be a synchronization or a lockstep movement of the data. So, if the clocking and delays are not absolutely synchronized, there will be problem. So, if we do not give sufficient time for a stage to finish its computation, then may be the wrong output will get stored in the register, in the output register ok, that we should be very careful about ok. So, let us look at skew and jitter first. These are two parameters which relate to clock distribution. So, what do you mean by clock distribution? Clock distribution essentially means let us say I have a chip. So, as I said normally we apply a single source of clock from output and inside there will be some circuitry which will allow this clock signal to go to several places in inside your chip where you need the clock signal to go. So, this clock signal will need to go here, it will need to go here, it will need to go here so, to all these points. Okay. So, this is one property that this clock network should follow or ensure and another thing is that as I said that the clock signal should reach all the endpoints approximately at the same time, because if it is not ensured then there can be some error in computation. Let us see these two terminologies Q and jitter which are related to this distribution problem and how are they related. Okay. Okay. So, as I said that the clock provides the common reference signal, it may be distributed all throughout the chip. Because it is distributed to all throughout the chip, the total length of the clock net can be pretty large and this may lead to several physical manifestations of the same signal. Various kinds of problems may, may arise because of this. So, what kind of problems? First is skew. Skew says maximum delay difference between any leaf nodes on the clock network. What does this mean? This is the clock network, the clock is coming here, it must reach everywhere. Let us say this is a point x, let us say this is a point y. So, what might happen is that in a point x, the clock signal might be like this. So, what we may see that because of differences in delay along the different paths, when the clock reaches in y, there can be a delay like say the clock is delayed by some amount that depends on the additional delay on the path. And this is what is called as skew, the difference or the difference in the delays that whenever I am feeding a clock, it is reaching the different endpoints or the leaves of the clock network at different times this is what is called skew. Similarly, you can have jitter like say here I am looking at a particular point not both x and y particular point x. So, what I can see is something like this let us say I have a point x where the clock is coming. Let us say I find that at uh, the first clock is coming after a delay of t the second clock is coming after delay of 0.9 t, third clock signal is coming after delay of 1.1 t. So, the time period for the same leaf node, the successive clock pulses are coming, they should all be coming ideally with a period of t, 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 t that gap, but there is a variation in the delay across clocks, across clock pulses that is called jitter. Jitter is a variation in the clock cycle time for a single 
leaf node and skew is across more than one leaf node there can be a variation in delay clocks can appear at various times. Okay. These are the two problems which are important and if not handled or tackled properly your circuit might not work in a proper way. Okay. So, let us see this is what skew and jitter as I have talked about they depict diagrammatically. So, you see this is a clock signal. So, where instead of ideal vertically rising and vertically falling we are showing slow rise and slow fall which are the typical shapes of the clock signal because there will be a finite rise time and finite fall time because of resistive and capacitive effects. And the actual clock what I am saying is that the time period is still t, but the edges are getting delayed. So, the ideal clock should have come here, but because of some additional delays the clock is reaching after some delay this is called skew, but the the skew delay is the same for all the successive pulses, but jitter says the first edge is coming after delay of this much, the second is coming after delay of something more this plus this, this is called jitter. Because the clock edges are coming not with a delay of t, but t plus jitter and this jitter can vary randomly. Okay. This is what jitter means. Okay. Let us now look at something called setup and hold times that concerns storage elements. So, what we look at is that a circuit like this let us say. So, again I am talking I am taking example of a pipeline there are register stages and there is a combination circuit. So, let us name these two clock signals separately I am calling this as driving clock this is as receiving clock and this is T logic is the delay through this logic circuitry or stage let us see. So, logic evaluation will begin at the rising edge of driving clock why because when we get the rising edge of driving clock then whatever is the input that is coming from the previous stage that will get stored in this register and this logic stage will start its calculation or computation. Okay. So, logic evaluation will begin at that time. So, for correct operation the logic signal or the logic circuitry must complete its evaluation before uh, it reaches the flip flop and the next stage of receive clock comes. So, what I am saying is that there is a delay of T logic and when this logic circuit has finished its calculation it must receive reach this point and then only this clock should come otherwise some wrong value might get stored. Okay. Now, what we say there is something called a setup time. So, every flip flop has some delay, delay with respect to what let a clock signal comes the input data does not immediately get stored in the flip flop there is a delay after which the data gets stored and also the input data has to be kept stable for minimum amount of time only then it will get stored correctly otherwise wrong data might get stored. This is the so called setup time. So, what the setup time is defined as is it is the minimum time the signal needs to be stable before it can be captured by the flip flop okay. and when you are calculating the setup time you should also take care of the skew and jitter between the drive clock and the receive clock. Okay. So, this we shall see slowly. So, look at this timing diagram again this is the drive clock this is the receive clock. So, what we are saying is that this is the delay of the logic maximum worst case delay of the stage. So, from this stage whenever the drive clock goes from 0 to 1 the stage starts calculating suppose it takes this much time t logic is this total time when 
the data is available in the output of this logic circuit. After that, I must keep this value stable minimum for this t setup amount of time, otherwise it will not get stored properly here. So, this is the requirement it says that you must wait for the maximum time the logic circuit requires to compute the data, then you must wait for a minimum amount of time t setup which is the setup time of the flip flops here, then only you should apply the receiving clock the receiving clock edge should not come before this, if it comes before this then there can be error. And this time can be further extended if we take into account skew and jitter, because if this skew and jitter there can be some additional delays in the clock also. So, receiving clock might get delayed. So, what will be the your timing requirement? Your total time period should be greater than or equal to the worst case delay of the logic circuit that means the stage of the pipeline plus the setup time of the flip flop receiving flip flops plus the maximum clock skew plus the maximum jitter. So, take you incorporate all of them add them up your time period should be at least greater than that, because whatever variations can be there and whatever minimum setup requirement is there you must provide that much time otherwise the correct data may not get stored in the receiving flip flop right. Okay. So, in a similar way you can have another kind of a constraint that is called a min delay constraint. You see setup time was what? Setup time says that you have a flip flop data is coming in the input, your input data must be stored for a minimum amount of time before the clock comes, that minimum amount of time is the setup time. Now, hold time says the other way around after the clock edge comes, you have to wait for some more time. See, it says that the storage element will have to hold their output signal for a minimum period of time. So, if you do not do it, then the following logic block like here same kind of a scenario driving clock receiving clock we shall be explaining with this. So, this this whole time says this is the definition. So, the idea is that the signal should not go through the logic circuit too fast and get captured by the rising edge of the receiving flip flop in the same cycle. Okay. This is okay, this something let me let me explain with this example again take this example. So, I have this driving clock, driving clock x comes t is the time period. So, what are the timing requirements? After the driving clock comes this hold time you must this hold time is the time you must keep the input data stable before the clock comes. And this uh, let me talk like this. Okay. Suppose I have a clock like this, it is easy to explain here. So, this is the clock edge, this is the clock edge. So, what I am saying whenever I have a data coming, so this is the time the clock edge is coming. What I am saying I must keep my data stable minimum time before this, this is my setup time and after the edge comes I have to again wait for a minimum time that is my hold time. These two times I must provide then only my flip flop operation will be guaranteed to be faithfully correct right. So, some minimum time before the edge, some minimum time after the edge these are setup and hold. So, you see in this diagram we have illustrated the hold time. So, after the edge comes a minimum amount of t hold time must be provided and, and only after that the logic calculation. So, what I am saying is that whenever the driver clock comes, so earlier we have assumed that whenever the driver clock comes the logic operation starts calculating immediately. 
but now we are saying no not immediately after the clock comes let us wait for another time t hold before this logic operation is allowed to start because that time t hold is required for the output to stabilize. So, whenever the clock comes t hold is that time that is required then only this t logic will come in this is the t logic delay and then you take care of this q and jitter. So, t logic plus t hold is the total time okay. t logic is the delay of this logic and t hold is the minimum time you should wait before you should uh, start the calculation. This two taken together should be greater than this time. So, so if this is not ensured your this operation of this circuit might fail ok. Okay. Now, let us look at some of the quantitative views of skew and jitter whatever we have talked about so far. There are a few constraints that need to be satisfied let us look at one by one. So, so again we consider that same kind of a scenario there are two register stages and there is a logic circuit in between this is logic this is a storage element R 1 this is another storage element R 2. So, they are connected like this. So, clocks well this clocks are same clock, but I am showing them separately because there can be some skew and jitter between them. So, there can be some delay between clock 1 and clock 2 because of skews and jitter. So, we have a scenario like this. So, we have now looking at skew jitter setup and hold times there are a few constraints that need to be satisfied for correct operation of the circuit. Let us summarize the constraints once more. And so, the first constraint is like this this is the maximum delay constraint what it says we told you about the total logic circuit delay the setup time delay then you take care of the skew and jitter of the receiving clock your time period should be at least greater than or equal to this. Now, logic and setup if you combine together let us call it t logic plus setup skew jitter if you combine together call it skew plus jitter they should be less than or equal to t this is one constraint setup time is what again I am repeating before the clock how much time you have to wait you have to feed the data and keep it stable that much time. Okay. So, here when you are talking about a scenario like this, this logic circuit is feeding data to the next stage. So, that setup time will apply to R 2 now, when data is coming here the data must be kept stable for minimum amount of time T setup before the clock here comes. Similarly, for R 1 this stage before that whenever the data comes it, there will be a component T setup here. So, logic plus t setup plus that jitter and skew that whole thing that should be taken care in that time period t ok. This is the first constraint. So, with this you can say that the maximum operating frequency with skew and jitter will be 1 by this, this will be the minimum delay. So, if you take uh, the reciprocal of this 1 by this, this will be the maximum frequency with which the circuit can operate ok. And if you ignore this q and jitter for the time being, theoretically the maximum frequency would have been just the logic and setup times this 1 by t logic setup time. So, now how much frequency you are losing you see now we are looking from a designer's point of view say as a designer I have designed a circuit I want it I want my circuit to run as fast as possible. So, how do I measure uh, the fastness of my circuit the maximum clock frequency. So, theoretically well initially I did not thought about uh, skew and jitter. 
So, just assuming that clocks are coming and getting distributed in a very nice way. So, I have estimated that well my maximum frequency should have been this, but after designing my circuit because of skew and jitter what I find that I cannot go up to that maximum frequency, because if I do that due to skew and jitter some of the stages might not store the data correctly. So, I have to delay the clock a little more. So, the actual frequency has to be reduced a little bit that is the price I am paying. So, here in the absence of skew and jitter I have this. So, you can say that that you are incurring something called a frequency cost. What is frequency cost? It is the difference in the frequency the maximum frequency that you could have achieved if skew and jitter were not present minus the actual frequency in place of skew and jitter divide by f max. So, if you do a simple if you do a simple uh, means arithmetic on this the expression comes to t u skew jitter plus t logic setup plus t skew jitter. So, so if you can reduce skew jitter as much as possible your this frequency cost will also reduce accordingly. So, one of the main challenge for the designer is is how to design the clock circuit, how to design the clock network such that your skew and jitter are minimized. Of course, you can say that well skew and jitter how this can be under my control, because once I fabricated a chip I do not know how much delay it will be taking, but at least you can try you can try to ensure that the length of all the clock wires are approximately same. So, that the estimated delay should be the same. So, the delay variation should be minimum the skew should be less ok this is what you can expect right. So, this is what and uh, just one uh, sample data I am showing. So, for uh, maximum frequency of 1 gigahertz and this is one sample plot which I am showing that as this q jitter increases from 0 these numbers are in picosecond up to 240 picosecond you can see that the frequency drops from 1 gigahertz down to about 800 megahertz. Okay. So, as skew jitter increases your maximum frequency also goes down. So, one thing that we will be discussing in our subsequent classes in our uh, clock design, clock tree design in this kind of uh, lectures, there we shall see that how we can design our clock circuitry in such a way that this jitter and skew can be reduced as much as possible, because that is a very important component to reduce the frequency cost to the extent possible. So, whatever I have talked about today in this lecture, we have tried to introduce the concept of frequency cost means how much frequency we have to sacrifice that means, the maximum speed of operation in presence of skew and jitter. Okay. The other parameters are something which we do not have any control about. For example, hold time and setup time these are characteristic of the flip flop the storage elements those times we have to provide those are mandatory delay requirements, but skew and jitter is something which you can play around with. Okay. So, we shall be looking at some more examples in our next lecture, so that you can have a better feeling about how we can do some kind of a trade off in terms of delays and other parameters, so that you can avoid some timing violations. You can you can be able to run your circuit at higher speeds and so on. So, with this we come to the end of this lecture, thank you.